We're here to celebrate that we're still standing at the end of 2020, and particularly to celebrate uh, women in the arts. Um, I'm Fiona Jenkins. I'm the convener of the ANU Gender Institute. I think I know a lot of you in the audience, actually. Um, so welcome to this celebration. We are recording this, uh, not on Zoom. We're um, making a, a recording that we can put on our website. Um, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the beautiful land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to their elders. And I'm extremely pleased that a very distinguished elder, um, the wonderful Dr. Matilda House, is here to give us all a welcome to her country. Thank you, Matilda. Have you got a mic? Anyone will do. That one, take that one. Hello, can you hear me up there? Yeah. Well, here we are. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon on this lovely day um, to, you know, to have this cherished things that we have about women in the arts. And of course, um, from the time we are born, we're doing something, even if it's making mud pies. Because at the end of the day, we're challenging ourselves for the future. And I want to welcome you here to the land of my ancestors and to thank you very much for the honour and the privilege and to thank you all for being here today. And I don't know the names of these beautiful ladies. I, you know, they may not lo like me calling them beautiful. <laughs> no, she's shaking her head like mad. But anyways, I will, um, I do acknowledge them and thank them very much for having me here today. And to always say, you know, what a wonderful world we live in when we know that women are leading the way right across the board. But when we talk about women in arts, it's a big step forward because all the years that have gone by and my favourite woman in the arts was Maria Callas. Uh, and I, every year, myself and my other two friends, we have a Maria Callas day. We do our hair, our eyebrows, lipstick, our beautiful red lipstick, and we have flowers around us and we have a beautiful lunch to celebrate Maria Callas. And I think people should look back and think of how women in those days struggled to get to do the things and to hear and be what they wanted to be. And, I, and she's my hero because she did go through such a lot and always maintained her dignity. And I'm quite sure you all have your own little heroes, but she was mine. And um, I just thought I'd share that with you. I hope you agree with me about her, because uh, I have portraits of her all around my place. Or oh, well, big ones and little ones all around the place. And my granddaughters, they asked me about her. And um, when I explained to them, but anyways, I got a book I found down at Redfern on her. And it was all in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so when they come, they said, Nan, didn't you look at it? Or just did you look at the picture? I said, oh, well, I don't know. Well, we'll have to find someone who can speak Mexican or Spanish. And uh, we'll have a good old read. But to this day, and for years and years, not just because of the last few years or whatever, but we've been celebrating Maria Callas every year. We don't go without it for a very special woman. And, of course, you would have your own heroes. Shake your heads, yeah, yeah. 
I can't stand up much because I've got a, I'm falling apart actually. Um, I fractured my shoulder and my hip as well. So um, I'm just happy to be here today to celebrate women in the arts and to always maintain the wonderful, wonderful struggles that we all had. And with the help of the guys, where would we be without them? <laughs> Any here today? <laughs> there you go. All it takes is one guy, mate. And that's what we love, to celebrate all together. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Do you mind if I just sit here? I can't get up there. And I, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. And welcome here to uh, Nambri Nunnawal land, on the land of my ancestors, Black Harry and the crew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Matilda. And um, this is one of the images of, uh, from the gallery, one of the works in the gallery, uh, National Gallery of Australia, um, Know My Name exhibition. Um, and of course, one of the first things you'll, you'll actually see as you walk into that exhibition is a wonderful portrait of this lady, Matilda House. Um, and it's made by um, Brenda Croft, who's in the School of Art here, and it's very, very um, impressive. Uh, the whole exhibition is an absolutely stunning um, collection of art by Australian women artists. And um, we wanted our celebration here today to uh, salute this work alongside the um, special exhibition, the Here I Am exhibition that's that's currently being curated uh, at the ANU. So you, there's a gallery upstairs that's got more incredible works and there's a fabulous outdoor exhibition as well. So we wanted to celebrate all of that. And I think one of the things to recall here is that the, the challenges for women artists in breaking into the sort of recognition that's represented by being shown in the National Gallery is uh, just as bad as the kind of challenges faced by women in science. Perhaps it's even worse. I think we tend to talk more about women in science and less about women in art, but the, the issues are very real and um, significant. So go see the Know My Name exhibition. It is fantastic. It's a really stunning, eye-opening exhibition. And um, Yes, it's centered around women artists, but there's nothing uniform about the kind of vision that that represents. And I was trying to think about, well, what, you know, what did distinguish it? And there is a really interesting feeling of the kind of absence of the male gaze that is such a prevalent feature of traditional art exhibition. It's, it's a very different, fresh feel to the gallery space. Um, and another thing I think that was quite striking was the sort of, um, crafts, the things that are called crafts because they're women's work, you know, shell work and beading and um, weaving of various kinds. They're all represented in the gallery. Um, and I think what it shows is what these are as kind of undervalued traditions because they're seen as, as women's work. Um, so there are those kind of themes, but aside from that, the art speaking of so many things, is speaking about environmental destruction, the feeling of falling through the air, um, the sense of bodies in and with space, the sort of respect for land and landscape that I think um, is such an important aspect of this, this body of work. Um, it's a dislocating exhibition in many ways, but it's also, I would say, a kind of reinstating exhibition. It's very exciting and very worth seeing, and I think it's art that's really apt for our difficult times. So for me, this celebration is a bit of a bookend to 2020. Um, at the start of the year, we had Indigenous artist Julie Goff and political theorist Bonnie Honig speaking as our guests at a workshop um, that I uh, organized with Des Manderson under the title Constitutional Imaginaries. And that was really about the way in which art can disturb and disrupt and refound a sense of political order. And we actually managed to hold it in one of the three weeks that were more or less normal at the start of 2020. So we felt very lucky there. Um, but one of the things that this uh, workshop was focused on was that it was the really important, very powerful role that art plays in negotiating all the difficult 
complex, often violent national histories that we live with. And Julie Goff's work obviously excels at this. And I just wanted to include one image that I gather is coming later um, in there's a sort of phase two of the Know My Name exhibition. There's, there's a lot more they want to show. And that's coming up, I think, in 2021. So this is her work, Chase, um, where she placed uh, this kind of thicket of tea tree sticks um, in the midst of the gallery. And I've, I've seen this work and it's incredibly pungent. There's a smell of the tea tree. And inside this thicket, there are these kind of scraps of cloth and material that you can tell has been some sort of violent chase that's taken place. And of course, the other wonderful thing about this work is the way it's placed in relation to the uh, picture of Captain Cook founding, you know, claiming the land. And it makes that, you know, it obscures your vision of that. It makes that a perplexing kind of image. It places us into relation with the, the kind of violence that that entailed. And I think it's a brilliant example of the ways in which a lot of contemporary indigenous art is dealing in extraordinarily powerful ways with the whole theme of what we might mean by acknowledgement. And so to circle back to that, that question of how we actually make acknowledgement, I think is really beautifully manifested in some of this work, that very difficult um, question. So ANU Gender Institute this year, we've had a quite a difficult year like everybody, um, but out of it, in fact, has emerged just by chance, really, a very strong um, focus on the arts. And we wanted to showcase that in this uh, closing panel for the year. Um, and uh, it's Gender Institute is very much about the members who come to us with ideas and, and creative thoughts about what they want to do. And our small grants are enabling, you know, just fantastic work. So really today is about showcasing that uh, work. And um, we've cast it as, as projects that are with, as, and about creative women in the arts. And um, Alison Alder, who will speak first, I'll introduce all the panelists and then we can um, have their presentations. But um, Alison is a printmaker in the School of Art and Design and her project, Still Waiting for Tomorrow, which um, we helped to fund, is an investigation of graphic works from the past together with the creation of new artworks to visualize a reimagined female future. And Alison actually also has two works in the Know My Name uh, exhibition, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the works that you've uh, collected and made. Um, the next two projects come from a special call for applications that we put out midway through the year on the theme of gender and COVID-19. Um, and I guess we weren't expecting to see such a strong focus on art in, in the projects that came through, but it was really great to see that because, of course, there's all sorts of ways in which art is important at these times. And um, Julianne Lamond, um, together with her research team, has been working for quite a while to monitor women's presence um, and progression in literary publishing uh, in collaboration with the Stella Prize. And her project asks what happens to women's voices during a pandemic, so exploring the impact of COVID-19 on women writers in Australia. Bonnie McConnell is an ethnographer in the School of Music. Uh, her project looks at women's musical networks and communication and social support in African responses to COVID-19. Um, and this year, we had a very special focus uh, on early career researchers because we felt this was a very important time to put in some extra support. And Bonnie has been part of a group um, that we've dubbed the ECR Incubator, which Margaret Jolly has been generously um, facilitating, um, alongside Anna uh, Rohrpach, who um, also has been participating in that mentoring group. Um, and has a wonderful project and is from the School of Art and Design uh, and her project Standard Stars um, is a very one of the very interesting projects that shows the intersections, the really productive intersections of art and science that I think are a very, um, a number of these projects at ANU which are very interesting. Um, so Anna is, um, is working with um, 
uh, drawings. Well, she'll tell you about it. I don't know why I'm telling you about it. <laughs> um, so our final speaker is Lillian Smythe from the College of Health and Medicine, also part of a, a team uh, from the art school. Um, who've been running an interdisciplinary workshop on visual art, human anatomy, and research processes. Um, and this is, a, again, an incredible project that's been awarded by the ANU for its, its innovation as a program. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Okay, so there'll be some time for Q&A after the panel, but we'll hear from um, everyone about their work, first of all. Alison, would you like to go first? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Numbri people. Thank you, Matilda. And also acknowledge the Ewan people where my studio is situated out near Braidwood. Um, this is a, a research project still waiting for tomorrow. It's um, basically I'm analysing artwork printed onto 20, 20th century ephemera um, with an aim to animate the history of women's activism to imagine an optimistic and resilient future through the development of new creative work based on this, um, this, this research. So graphics embedded um, onto printed ephemera during times of social change provide valuable insights into how women agitated for change and put forward new ideas regarding what a positive future may look like. And as we look at a world facing climate induced catastrophe, global pandemics and weakening democratic processes, all of which negatively impact upon women, um, it becomes important to share these cultural products and their, and their strategies recontextualised through um, contemporary art. So my own background is, a, is as a political poster maker from sort of the early 1980s, and that's sort of the start of my interest in this work. So um, I'll just show you some of them. So this, this work behind me, um, the impetus for this idea came from this work actually that I found in the Tom and Mary Wright collection held in the Butlin archives here at the ANU, um, which I thought was prescient regarding the world today. So A New Deal for Women, which was um, published in 1944, portrays a family looking out from their home onto a new dawn, which I think is pretty relevant and able to be adapted in this new isolationist world that we're living in now. Um, and I'll just quickly go through some of the other images. So these are two um, ones from 1929 and ones from 1941. So I thought, you know, there's the one from 1929, the militant women of Australia, I thought was so amazing in that the typography is sort of so minimalist and so sort of restrained, and yet the arguments that they put forward are so strong. And I just love that sort of dissonance between the typography and the and the work. Um, so the production of posters, placards and flyers over the 20th century um, generated and supported activist communities with low cost do it yourself methods of production, which enabled productive discourse between groups outside of the male centred mainstream. And this cultural production, in my opinion, opens up new avenues of thinking and, as historian Michelle Arrow writes, provides a way of imagining national belonging outside of the framework of efficiency and productivity, which I also think is interesting in these times, especially at the School of Art and Design at the moment. Um, this, asserts, this asserts assertion, so if you look at these works, is most evidence in the contemporary resurgence of placards and used in situ and subsequently online as potent methods of communication. Um, so the ephemeral, occasional, fanciful, prosaic and at times mundane printed images found in the archive provide a variety of perspectives developed during times of social unrest, change and anxiety. And these cultural products um, um, these cultural products and their strategies provide clues for action today through not only their militancy but also their humour. The works do not aim to neutralise the re revolutionary thinking of past generations but to continue and enhance the legacy of truth telling and idealism whose power in these works I believe is still palpable. I'd love to know what every woman should know, but I'll have to make it up myself. Um, in this work, um, I'll just show you 
another one. So this is sort of from my own era. This is from um, Frances Button, who worked in Matilda Graphics. Her work is actually in a feature in the Know My Name exhibition at the moment. She's the woman who I've written about in the Know My Name catalogue, who did the amazing vulva with the plastic zipper, um, crochet doily. It's an amazing piece of work. And she was also instrumental in the Women's Domestic Needlework Group, which produced an exhibition called The Doily Show, which um, just catapulted a whole different idea of how women's work is undervalued and that we should look at, it, at what our own uh, interests are and what we make and that they also tell stories. So that's one of Frances's work as she was making a living as a graphic designer. And then there's this one, which I think is a real cracker. So if you look at the, at the text, it's got, you know, grizzly stories in Canberra and it's got a thing about Brazil and then, you know, that could be Trump there in the pink, you know, over on the left. So, I mean, I think these images are really interesting and, and great to look at in terms of how we're seeing ourselves now and that we could, um, for one thing is that we see these Im images and not a lot has changed, but in other ways we have to keep working. And it's through these activist communities and groups and this low cost work that I believe we can do that. Um, and then finally, thank you for Chris, to Chris Wallace over here for this slogan, which I think is particularly apt. Um, yeah, share the load, share the power, share the reward. Thank you very much, everybody. Can I just say something first? Yes. I didn't yes. see, she knows I'm coming up to see her. <laughs> she didn't even get up and say, hello, Matilda. Here I am. I worked with her father 30 years ago. He was my friend and the most loveliest person that I could ever meet. And um, I want to say to you, Alison, <laughs> you know, I hadn't forgotten you, but I am a bit blind as well. <laughs> I want to say to you, thank you so much for your family, for what you have done for my family. Thank I you. really, really appreciate it. And I want to thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. But that's, I've known that family for over 30 years. We walked Namaji National Park. We could circle around Canberra over a hundred thousand times with, with her father leading us the way. Thank you. Great memories, hey? <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Julianne. Thanks very much. Um, and it's great to be here. Um, so this project uh, looks at what happens when a field of national artistic inquiry or activity is undergoing real change in relation to gender in inequality, um, but then undergoes another major realignment due to um, a global health and economic crisis. So we're asking what happens to feminist gains during a pandemic? Are we back at square one? How might we shore up what has been achieved? So we're looking at the field of women's writing and thinking about whose voices are heard and valued in the Australian public sphere. When we talk about writers here, we're talking about creative writers, um, so fiction and poetry. We're looking at playwrights. We're looking at literary critics, so people who write about books in newspapers and magazines, and literary studies academics, so who write about and teach books um, in academic contexts. And this is a body of people who make up our literary culture, who shape who we read, what we value, and how we think about it. So historically, in Australia as elsewhere, women have had less access to um, the avenues that enable their work to, to reach a reading public, especially book reviews. Um, but that is something that has begun to shift. So I think it's a little known fact that since 2015, the ANU Gender Institute has been supporting and collaborating on a research project that has made a real and measurable impact on the gender equality of the Australian literary landscape. And that project is the Stella Count. So it all started in 2010 when um, US-based feminist literary organisation VEDA, Women in Literary Arts, um, started looking at the prestigious publications that publish the kind of review that can make a writer's career. Um, and they found that the books being reviewed in these publications were overwhelmingly written by men. So they started collecting statistics um, and publishing their results. And in Australia, in 2012, the newly funded um, feminist literary nonprofit, the Stella Prize, um, was wondering whether the situation in Australia was the same. So they started counting too and found that indeed it was. 
So this was the results from the first Stella count. So red is, the me is um, books by men being reviewed and blue is the books by women. So in 2013, my colleague Melinda Harvey and I started working with the Stella Count um, and we said, what if we asked more detailed questions, not just about whether gender bias exists, but how it's working in these publications. So we started asking questions like, what is the proportion of men and women receiving the long, high profile reviews that really boost a writer's career? Um, and unsurprisingly, um, men, male writers were receiving most of them. And in 2015, we received a grant from the Gender Institute um, to get some ANU students involved involved in this project. So making connections with the Stella Prize, with the literary world in Melbourne and participating in public events like this one. So, we, so these, um, these interns also um, use this work then to think about their own research projects around gender and literature. So we've now run two sets of internships. Um, the photo on the left is a lesson to all short people when you're being photographed with tall people. Um, we have now um, run two sets of these internships. Um, and the second time around, the number of applicants increased fourfold. And when we were reading the applications, it was just this moment of just being inspired by these young women who are at ANU, these students, who have a real interest um, and engagement with questions of gender and the literary sphere, gender and culture here at ANU. So we kept counting and things began to change. So this um, is the representation of, of women authors in Australia's review pages from when the count began to the last count in 2018. The 2019 count's been delayed because of COVID. So in the first stellar count um, in 2012, only one of the 12 publications counted had reached, had, was at gender parity in the representation of men and women in its pages. In the last count, nine of the 12 had reached parity and one of them, the Fairfax Papers, is very nearly there. So we went across the period of this project, we've gone from a situation um, where gender inequality was to the norm to now gender equity in book reviews is now no longer the exception, but it is the norm. But then this unusually happy story about, um, about gender equity uh, was interrupted by a global pandemic um, with its impact, as you all know, you don't need to see these headlines, felt, dis felt disproportionately by women who've borne the brunt of job losses and increased caring responsibilities. It's also that COVID-19 has also ravaged the arts sector in Australia. And as you all know, has had a dramatic impact on university budgets, especially for contract and casual staff. And initial findings are also, these, these studies are beginning to emerge here where we've seen COVID's impact had a gendered impact in terms of research productivity and submission rates. From the point of view of Australia's literary sector, um, it's really important to recognise that academic research and teaching in literary studies in, in, in academia is deeply intertwined with public literary cultures. So the concurrent impacts of COVID on both university and public and publishing sectors is really significant for our literary culture. So before the pandemic, um, Australia's writers were already financially precarious, but now their main sources of income, um, the publication of their work in newspapers and magazines, literary journalism and casual university teaching have all been placed under threat. So Australian writer Gail Jones said in a piece in The Guardian last week, writers' incomes are disastrously low, $12,900 a year on average, and COVID-19 has eliminated other forms of supplementary income. So for playwrights, um, Pub productions have been cancelled, commissions have dried up. For novelists and their publishers, the main avenues to promote and sell new books, so literary festivals, tours, book launches and events have largely disappeared. Um, a recent Australian Society of Authors um, survey found that one of the major impacts is actually the cancellation of, event, of workshop events, so in libraries, schools and universities. Um, and writers often really rely on these to make, to make, um, to make an income. So we're in a situation where the entire university and literary sectors in Australia are undergoing this major realignment and we don't yet know what they will look like when we come out the other side or even to something like COVID normal. Whatever that will mean, I don't really know. But um, So is it going to be a culture in which women's voices are heard and valued? 
So what we're seeking to do with this project is to track some indices of women writers' access to the public sphere before, during and after the height of the pandemic, so from 2019 to 2022, to understand what its impact will be on the gender equality of our literary culture. So to do this, I'm working with um, critic and scholar from Monash University, Melinda Harvey, um, the Ethel lecturer in um, drama here at ANU, Rebecca Claude, and one of our wonderful PhD students, Alice Grundy. And we're, co we're collecting data about gender and publication across Australian newspapers, magazines, online and academic journals and creative journals like these, and this slide is purely just to show you how beautiful their covers are, um, to understand um, the impact of COVID-19 on the ability of women writers to reach audiences and on the gender equality of Australia's literary cultures more broadly. Thanks. Thank you, Julianne. We're just, we're just having to sanitise the clicker in between. We've got COVID rules up here. Okay. Thank you, Matt Brace. All right, it's great to be here and hear about these, this amazing work. I really want to thank the Gender Institute for this opportunity and also the uh, ECR incubator program, which has been amazing. It's great to be a part of this sort of interdisciplinary, really supportive network. Um, so my current research is looking at how uh, COVID-19 is affecting women's musical performance practices. And this is a multi-sided project, quite an ambitious project uh, in Gambia, Tanzania, and in Australia. But I'm focusing uh, today just on a few themes that are coming out of the Africa-based research. And this project is ongoing. So these are kind of some preliminary um, findings right now. And the project is being conducted in collaboration with uh, partners in Tanzania and the Gambia. Dr. Kedma Mapana from the University of Dar es Salaam and the Chamwino Arts Council, um, Buba Dabo in the Gambia Ministry of Health and Social Welfare and the National Center for Arts and Culture. So this is very much a, um, a partnership. So I've been doing work in the Gambia and Tanzania for over 15 years now, um, looking at music. And the current project is extending this long-term research to explore the impact of the pandemic uh, on women. And we found that reactions to COVID-19 have reinforced gendered forms of inequality and stigmatization. And these are familiar patterns in responses to other diseases such as HIV, AIDS, and Ebola. At the same time, the pandemic has also inspired new forms of connection and solidarity across social and geographic distance. So we're exploring these seemingly contradictory dynamics, the way the pandemic divides us and also brings us closer together in new ways. And music provides a unique lens through which to understand some of this complexity. And the changes to our creativity and social relations that we see emerging at the current moment, uh, some of these will likely be short-lived, but others, uh, we expect will endure into the future. So it's really important to understand what is happening in terms of these changes to musicality and sociality. And a comparison of the Gambia and Tanzania enables us to consider diversity in the way that our performers are responding to the pandemic and to examine perspectives that are missing from dominant narratives uh, about music and COVID-19 and also forms of music that are uh, tend to have less prestige and less attention uh, placed on them, despite their significance within communities. Musical performance practices are highly complex and diverse, both within and across these research sites. Um, in addition, these two countries have had very different public health responses. So the Gambia has been praised for its rapid response to the disease, while Tanzania's government has been widely criticized for suppressing information about the virus but our focus is uh, primarily on the artistic impacts and responses. So some initial findings. Uh, first of all, the pandemic restrictions have inspired uh, changes to the creative process. Um, for example, many of the community-based groups that we're working with have had to shift from a collective compositional approach where uh, music is composed in a large ensemble setting to a more hierarchical model where one or two people compose pieces and then uh, teach them to others in a small group setting. And for many groups that are used to performing in close proximity to one another, they find this kind of approach uh, to rehearsal and performance very unsatisfactory. Right? Physical closeness is very much part of the participatory music experience, the sound um, and the overall event. 
So not being able to come together in this way fundamentally changes music making. At the same time, for others, it has opened up new opportunities. So particularly for more high profile, commercially successful performers, um, they've been able to disseminate their music through social media to access new audiences, to engage in new kinds of collaborations. But for many of the uh, community-based groups, this is not an option or these, these kinds of opportunities are much more limited. And groups have also experienced changes in the sense of social connection associated with music making. In the absence of restrictions, music events and rehearsals are seen very much as social activities. They create a sense of social connection and support for participants. So not being able to play music together has magnified a sense of social isolation. And for some people, they've been able to maintain connections through social media, through phone, through text messages, and sharing music through these um, formats as well. But for others, their access to these kinds of uh, communication is limited. So we see a disparity in the way that the pandemic is affecting different groups, with women particularly impacted due to uh, factors such as limited access to technology, uh, poor internet connectivity, lack of income to buy phone data, and higher rates of illiteracy, which make it harder to engage with um, social media. And many people have experienced increased economic stress due to a lack of opportunities to perform and the broader economic challenges of the pandemic, and particularly the reduction in tourism. So some music groups have worked together to support um, their most vulnerable members. So when someone is experiencing extreme hardship, other group members collect small donations and then deliver it to the family that is uh, in difficulty. So these musical networks are also uh, social support networks. And in terms of the repertoire that is being produced during this period, we've seen a proliferation of songs relating to COVID-19. And these take different forms. So some songs include very detailed health information about how to prevent the spread of the virus. Other <coughs> songs focus on ways we can cope during crisis. So these include uh, religious messages from Christian or Muslim perspectives, or messages of social support and love in the face of crisis. This repertoire builds on established approaches in these regions where women's songs have long served as a resource for navigating change and uncertainty, uh, creating a sense of social support and communicating life-saving information. So in other words, the performers that we're working with in both countries do not see their work as solely entertainment. The musical uh, practices in Tanzania and the Gambia are highly complex with significant diversity in musical features and social contexts of performance. At the same time, the responses to COVID-19 reflect a shared view of musical performance as a resource for social support, for collective action and dissemination of information. So these are themes that we're continuing to explore uh, in this research, which is ongoing. To end, I'd like to play uh, an excerpt of a song. We're in the wrong direction. An excerpt of a song from the Nyati group in Nzali village in Tanzania. So this song that we'll hear is in the Nindo style. Uh, the style used to be associated with gatherings um, called by local chiefs, where they would disseminate information to local residents. Um, since the 1970s, this Nindo style has been adapted for a variety of entertainment and communication contexts. Um, it features the distinctive Wagogo vocal harmonies and the vocal techniques and women's dancing style that's characteristic of this region. So the song that we'll hear is in the Kiswahili language, and it calls on all Tanzanians to work together to follow the advice of health workers to prevent the spread of COVID-19 through good hygiene and, and physical distancing. Could you press play on that? I'll just play one minute.
Thanks, everyone. I'll stop there. Thank you, Bonnie. It's so nice to have music included as well. Um, so Anna Rapak is going to tell us about her project. Yeah. Pause while right. yeah. white. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, sorry. Um, today I'll be talking about um, a project that I'm making as part of a research project, a research fellowship at the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in Sydney. Um, I'm an artist. I work with traditional and new media, including drawing, moving image, digital media and interactive installation. And I think this project is a good example of how I bring all of those elements together. Um, so I, want, I went to the museum wanting to explore mixed reality as a digital storytelling technique in relation to museum objects, particularly narratives related to the process of recording and observing meteorolo meteorological and astronomical astronomical events in Australian history. Sorry, I'm getting my <laughs> words mixed up. Um, I began by looking at objects such as me measurement devices and first-hand descriptions of weather conditions and natural phenomena, particularly searching for parts of the collection that linked scientific concepts to personal stories. And I came across the Astrographic Catalogue, which was a global scientific endeavour to map the sky in the 19th and early 20th century. As part of this international project, women played an important role by working as star measurers in the Sydney, Melbourne and Perth observatories from 1890 to 1964. Their job was to take the measurements of the astrographic plates that the male astronomers created at night in the observatories and calculate information including the position and magnitudes of stars across the relevant sky sections for each observatory. So I was interested in the astrographic catalogue for several reasons. Um, the women weren't sufficiently recognised for their contribution at the time and it also provides an interesting insight into this shift from qualitative to quantitative methods of observation and representation as photography took over from manual processes and that's something I'm interested in my work generally. So at the museum and at Sydney Observatory, I looked at the type catalogues, written um, notebooks, glass plates, and the measuring machines that were involved in the astrographic catalogue. And I was particularly drawn to the handwritten log books that um, contain these long form calculations, scribbled notes, um, crossed out errors, and also importantly, the signatures of these women. These marks capture a materiality of both human labour and technological development that came together through the astrographic catalogue and also represents processes and identities that became lost in the official typed catalogues. Uh, so I'm making a physical installation and a virtual experience based on this that reanimates the women's handwriting and illuminates their work by focusing on their signatures. In the installation, um, which this is some work in progress for the installation here, um, the women's handwriting is laser etched onto the surface of circular double-sided mirrors that will mechanically rotate and be lit in ways that reflect the writing into the darkened space around them. It references mirrors in um, telescopes, as well as the intimacy of a makeup mirror, and also alludes to fundamental elements of astronomy, such as cycles, orbits, and the motion of light and shadow. And there's also an in important interplay between visibility and invisibility. Um, by etching away the reflective surface, I'm allowing the absence of the women's drawn marks to emerge to deliberately amplify the invisibility of their original work. Um, to make the digital version of the work, I intended to base this digital artwork on the structure of a stargazing app used to look at the sky. Um, that usually shows constellations appearing on the screen of a mobile phone. Um, but in my work, I wanted the real positions of the stars in the sky to be layered with signatures of the women who mapped them for the astrographic catalogue. This approach aimed to use the technology made possible through the knowledge gained from their work to reinsert their names into that space. 
So while I have basic skills in augmented reality, the Gender Institute grant allowed me to work with a developer, Peter Heyman, to make something that wouldn't have otherwise been possible with my own skills. These images show the first iteration of this work, which was um, a digital mock-up of the mirror installation, um, where the mirrors became searchlights, that, spotlights that you could use to search a digital virtual sky for the signatures. Um, this work is um, showing more of a first prototype of the user's perspective, um, being able to use the mobile phone to search around a virtual space. So um, just in terms of process, while Peter was developing the app, I've been working on the archival research, data collection and making the drawn animations, which is what I'll go through briefly now. Um, so returning to the archives for a second time, I began exploring how a sense of personality emerged through the logbooks and how the varying styles of handwriting correspond to the signatures that I was looking for. I also had conversations with researcher Tona Stevenson, who's written a great deal on the astrographic catalogue and that was really helpful for my work, and the astronomer at Sydney Observatory, Andrew Jacob, um, about the scope of my project. Um, and like a lot of my projects, I realised that what I wanted to do was way too big and I had to scale it back a bit. So a, a way I decided to do that was to represent the data according to the areas of sky captured in a photographic plate rather than trying to look at constellations which were much smaller. Um, and by doing that, I was able to reduce the size of the project but still encompass its aims. That said, I might still have to reduce it more. <laughs> um, so basically where I'm up to now is um, data collection still and um, cross-referencing multiple sources of data to match the, those plate numbers with the women's signatures. Um, I'm doing this using a document or a few documents at the Sydney Observatory and the New South Wales State Archives that provide various information um, with plate numbers, um, the minute books, which is the the bottom left image has really nice personal notes in it, um, such as one of them says, Miss Alexander absent because she was ill in the morning. And I really like finding gems like that within the logbooks. Um, and I'm also looking at the, there's hundreds of, probably thousands of logbooks in boxes in the museum archives. And I'm looking at as much of that as I can and linking it all together in this epic um, spreadsheet. Um, so eventually this data will be fed into the um, program. Um, this is the first prototype, which shows how I'm using the plate or the animation, the drawn animation of the plate as a window into different views of the sky. This example shows a parallax effect where when you look through the plate, it gives a 3D view of a sky that you would otherwise see in a two-dimensional form. Um, and this um, shows a build-up of those plates and I'm aiming to include more and more plates. And as you explore this virtual space and walk up, um, you can, you'll see the signatures kind of building up which um, would happen if you were in a virtual space exploring that night sky. So um, one thing I'm excited about is the patterns that are emerging when the plates are positioned at the right um, declination, um, which is their position in the sky, um, because it, the patterns are emerging with, so this is showing because it's a ring that's representing the Sydney sky section because I'm working with the Sydney um, astrographic plates at this stage. Um, and there's also nice relationships um, emerging between two-dimensional and three-dimensional space when there's a build-up of these plates as well. Um, so the, the, yeah, I've got a lot to do on this stage still, but one thing I'm hoping to do in the future is integrating sound and narratives of potentially women scientists or astronomers um, working now reflecting on this narrative. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. So, um, Lillian. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to wait for the wipes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Anna doesn't have to do it, but we'll do it anyway. All right. Did I turn the mic on successfully? Yes. All right, so I'm the rogue scientist on today's panel, and possibly paradoxically, I'm going to be talking about reintroducing women to the arts. 
once we get some slides. So I guess as some background, um, the problem that we're looking to solve here is that young female academics tend to opt out of academia. Sorry, there's my lovely title slide. So basically what the literature suggests is that this actually boils down to fear. So it's part, partly because of precarious employment, it's because of being systematically underpaid at every level of academia, it's about an uneven distribution of familial responsibilities, but basically women feel unsafe in academia and as a result they reduce their degree of creativity, they don't take risks and they're not confident. And because of this they actually typically end up opting out. So this is a problem that we wanted to solve. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world where young female academics are opting out just because they're afraid. So what we wanted to do was um, build a series of workshops that helped young female academics in building their creativity in their work, in building confidence, and in building their propensity for risk taking. So luckily for me, I know a crack team of female academics who already have a course that runs along these lines for students. So the course is Biol 2222, which is more colloquially referred to as the Exquisite Corpse. This team here is Christina Valter, Lisa Crossing, and Alex Webb, and they want a really great course that integrates anatomy and visual art. So the students actually learn both, both disciplines alongside one another on equal footing, by focusing on the human form. So we've done some research on this course, which is how I'm involved because I'm a psychologist, and we've done some research on this course, and what we find is that the students actually do improve in terms of their creativity and in terms of their self-perceptions of creativity. They improve in confidence, and they're much more willing to take risks in their work. And what they suggest that that's caused by is um, what we're calling structured uncertainty, which is basically uh, a context where it's open and there are options, but there are limits. So you're not just kind of left in a free for all where you sort of panic and freeze up, but actually we sort of structure and scaffold the way you deal with uncertainty. And the second thing is the interdisciplinarity of it. So dealing with different perspectives, different ways of looking, different ways of thinking, different ways of problem solving. And finally, what we're calling defamiliarization, which is basically where they get to recognize familiar concepts in a different form. So the number of science students who are astonished at the relationship between the iterative process of making art and the hypothesis testing concept, every year they're, they're flabbergasted and it actually helps in the way that they think about the way they might approach research. So what we did was we tried to make a series of workshops for young female academics, so we didn't put a limit on what that means, people got to self-define, that actually uses this paradigm for professional development. So basically we based it around the human form, partially because two of our team are anatomists and partially because it's a very good analog to the research process. So I'm gonna whiz through our concepts fairly quickly because I wanna show you a lot of the art that our participants made because it's very good. So our first session was a sculpture walk. So the idea of this was to expose the participants to the ideas of context. So we did our sculpture walk of the ANU sculpture collection and talked a lot about the difference between making an art and putting it in a context and making some art that actually responds to the context. So we had a look at the ways in which various artworks had been sort of made and plonked versus made in response to a particular area and discussed the way that that actually relates to the research process. You know, you can run a study and try and shoehorn it into a journal, or you can actually try and respond to the literature and the lay of the land. And then a pandemic broke out, which was not great for us because we wanted face-to-face, -face, hands-on collaborative workshops. So then we actually moved online for something like six months. So part of what we wanted to do with these workshops was to get the, the participants to form a community in some way and share experiences. And that was supposed to happen organically as part of the exercises, but because we've been moved online, we basically just put all that content in the online stuff. So every month we met and we shared experiences and we set them homework. So those were kind of fun and achievable things that were also important steps on the way to basically digging your heels in in academia. So things like saying no to something. So your homework for this month was to go home and say no to something and then report back on how that went. Take a professional risk. Edit the word just out of all of your emails. <laughs> other, other such fun bits of homework. And people found them quite challenging but also quite rewarding. And I think the largest take home was nothing falls down if I say no. I don't get fired for not apologizing in every email I send. And that was a really useful process for our, our participants just to kind of get comfortable with each other, form a group, and think about the sorts of issues, you know, the death of a thousand cuts it is being a young female academic. And then we opened back up so we could have more workshops, which was great. So the next workshop that we had was focused around the human spine. So the concept here was looking at strength and flexibility and, you know, the foundation on which you build things. And so what we did was actually we, we got our anatomist in, so this is Christina on the left here, explaining the anatomy of the human spine and the anatomy of the vertebrae. And then we had Elisa talking about how you might draw the vertebrae and thinking about ways of looking and ways of relating to the spine in the context of what you know that its anatomical function is. We then worked them through a few different ways of doing art, so I guess I should preface this with none of our participants were artistically inclined. They were from a broad range of backgrounds, but none of them were visual artists. 
And so we did some analytical drawing, because that often makes the scientists a little bit more comfortable, but we also did some expressive drawing. So I have a little gallery here of some of ours. So on the left here, we have one of our analytical drawings from Ellen Lynch, who is an engineer. Then we have one of our more expressive drawings from Cassie Williams, who is in literature. And then we have another one of our analytical drawings from Jean Du, who is in public health and is also here. So a round of applause for Jean. Isn't this a good drawing? <laughs> our next session was then what we call the beautiful mess. So this one was about letting go. This was about letting go of the perfectionism, letting go of the control. So one of the largest problems that we find for young female researchers is that they're afraid to start. They're afraid to mess it up. They're afraid to take that step. So what we did was focused on abstraction and then curation. So basically the first stage was, here's some paint, here's some paper, here's some materials, make a mess. And you can see we created quite a bit of mess. So we have lots of these and everybody was sitting home and they're great. The second stage of the workshop was looking at the mess you've made and picking out the good bits. So assembling it, curating the mess. So it was a lesson in basically throwing everything at the wall and then pulling off the good bits and assembling it together into a cogent idea. So again, we have some great work here. So on the left here, this is, this is Ellen's work. This is talking about her PhD work, which was about basically tearing back some very rigid and black and white sort of ideas in engineering and looking at the human aspects underneath. Uh, the middle one here is another one of Jean's, which I really liked. And it was about kind of chaotic spiral ideas. And this one on the right here was about Jean's work in menstruation. So it's about the tension between you know, the blue menstruation you see in ads and the reality of it, and also the, the, the tension between you know, real and appearance in that she has some physical drips as well as painted drips. So our final workshop, and I'm talking very quickly because I know I ramble, our final workshop was looking at invisible bodies. So this is basically about drawing the implied body by drawing empty clothes. But the main research lesson that participants took away from this one is that we only gave them one piece of paper. So they got to keep iteratively drawing over and over their mess. The process was draw it, okay, now rub it back, draw it again, rub it back. Once it got into a mess, you tried a different material to try and build over the top. So basically the process was about working through the mess you've made and actually following it through to completion. And again, we have some great art here. So we have Cassie Ellen and Jean again, who were very good about giving me consent to show everyone their art. So you can see on the left here, we have an empty leather jacket, an empty dress, and another empty dress. And these were great projects in terms of just committing to decisions you made. I want to cover the whole page in black ink. And then I have to work with that and kind of develop that through to a great artwork. And so I think in the end, what we found was that this was a great pilot program, but we want more data. So obviously, you know, COVID was, was a substantial effect. We couldn't actually get as many people as we wanted to into rooms and everyone had to wear masks and gloves and gowns and it was all a bit much. But basically we got a lot of great feedback from our participants that it had made them feel like they could try things. You know, it, it gave them permission to fail. It gave them permission to make a mess. And that was basically what we set out to do. And I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, I think that really evidences what a fantastic array of interesting projects that we've been um, happy to sponsor this year. 